tell our viewers what is insulin resistance and what causes it in the first place. Okay. So, so insulin resistance is a, is a pretty confusing topic. Uh, not because the biology is confusing, but because the interpretation of the biology has become overly complex in the world in which we live. So if you go into the scientific literature and actually look at what truly causes di uh, insulin resistance and what most strongly influences the development of insulin resistance, uh, what you will find is something that I found very early in my research career, which was that I was given the task of inducing insulin resistance in laboratory animals. That was the experiment that we were trying to do. So we induce insulin resistance and then you try and recover that insulin resistance using intermittent fasting and or calorie restriction. So I went into the literature and I started to read, well, how do you induce insulin resistance in laboratory animals? I don't know. The whole time I was thinking, you gotta feed them some kind of sugar. You gotta feed them fructose. You gotta feed them sucrose. You gotta feed them some kind of refined sweetener because refined sweeteners exacerbate, cause insulin resistance and exacerbate diabetes. So I went in with that preconceived notion that I started reading. And before I knew it, I started seeing the words lipid, fatty acid, saturated fatty acid. Um, and and these, these words kept on showing up over and over and over again. Before I knew it, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is happening here? It doesn't make any sense. And as I read more and more and more, I found out that in these experiments, when uh, researchers have tried to induce insulin resistance in animals, the most effective way, the fastest, and the, the, uh, the method that's used uh, as a predominant method is to feed animals a diet that is extremely high in fat and that is especially high in saturated fat. And by doing so, they can induce this state known as insulin resistance, which primarily affects your, your, your muscle tissue and your liver tissue. So what ends up happening in this situation is that when you eat a diet that's high in saturated fat, when I say high in saturated fat, I mean something like uh, you know, 10 to 20% of total calories coming specifically from saturated fat, and more appropriately, uh, a diet that contains approximately 60 plus percent of calories of total fat. So regardless of whether that fat comes from animal sources or from plant sources, the idea is that when you're eating a diet that's predominantly based in high fat foods, then uh, your risk for the development of insulin resistance goes up dramatically. So in this situation, these fatty acids, they enter your mouth, they travel down to your esophagus, they get all the way into your stomach, they're then passed into your small intestine, and inside of your small intestine, it's like a tube where these, these fatty acid molecules, they get separated from the food in which you ate them, and then they, they make their way through the walls of your small intestine to get into your lymph system. From your lymph system, they end up getting into your blood. Once they get into your blood, they're using your blood as a highway system to get to tissues all throughout your body. They want to get to your adipose tissue, your liver, your muscle, your kidneys, your pancreas, you name it. Any tissue that touches, uh, that touches the blood can use fatty acids as a fuel with the exception of your brain. Your brain cannot do that. Now, these fatty acids are transported all throughout your, your body. And uh, these fatty acids get uptaken into primarily three different tissues. The first one is your adipose tissue. So your adipose tissue is your fat tissue. Your fat tissue lives in many different locations. You find some in your neck. You find some in your armpits. You find some uh, in you know, the bottom of your triceps, in your abdomen, in your butt, in your legs. It's distributed all throughout your body. And your, your adipose tissue is actually a safe place to store fatty acids. So when those fatty acids come in from your diet, they go into your blood, they can get, make their way into adipose tissue because your adipose tissue is specifically designed to uptake those fatty acids, to store them, and then to release them when is necessary. But in addition to getting into your adipose tissue, these fatty acids also make their way to your liver and to your muscle. And that's when life can become problematic. The reason is because your liver and your muscle are specifically designed to uptake and store small amounts of fatty acids and small amounts of saturated fatty acids. That's how they're designed. So the liver and muscle are exposed to the blood. These fatty acids are in circulation. They march their way directly into tissues because these tissues don't really have a way to sort of defend themselves against the influx of these fatty acids. These fatty acids end up inside of your muscle, they end up inside of your liver. And over the course of time, as you consume higher and higher amounts of fat or a high amount of fat over a long period of time, then your muscle and liver end up becoming slightly overwhelmed with too much fatty acid. So these fatty acids accumulate, they congregate into a thing called a lipid droplet, and this lipid droplet gets larger and larger and larger inside of cells in your liver and inside of cells in your muscle. Now, 
the reason this is important in the world of diabetes is because the next time you try and eat something that's carbohydrate rich, whether it's a banana, whether it's a mango, whether it's a bowl of quinoa, some raisins, it could be uh, black beans, anything that contains carbohydrate energy. The carbohydrate energy enters your mouth, travels down your esophagus, gets into your stomach, gets into your small intestine. From your small intestine, your small intestine then starts to break apart these carbohydrate chains into glucose molecules. Glucose is absorbed, it's put into your blood. The glucose is then in circulation now. This is the second fuel that's now trying to find a home inside of your brain, inside of your liver, inside of your adipose tissue, your muscle, you name it. So these glucose molecules, unlike fatty acids, they have to be uh, accompanied by an escort. And the escort is called insulin. So a small amount of glucose is able to just passively diffuse in the tissues, a very small amount, without the use of, uh, of insulin. But the majority of glucose in your blood requires insulin in order to get into tissues. So insulin comes and it knocks on the door of a tissue and says, hey, liver, there's glucose in the blood. Would you like to take up that glucose right now? And the cells in the liver can respond by either saying, sure, and they open the door and they allow the glucose to come in, or they say, no, I'm not gonna let this stuff in, and they leave the glucose outside. Now, in a situation where you've already consumed a high-fat diet for some period of time, and these saturated fatty acid molecules have accumulated inside of liver cells and inside of muscle cells, the next time you eat a carbohydrate-rich food, the glucose molecules come to the door, insulin knocks, hey, I got this glucose molecules, do you wanna take it up? And the tissues respond by saying, I can't. I don't have the opportunity to do it right now. The reason is because I have all this fatty acid material inside of me first. This lipid droplet has grown to be too large. I gotta oxidize this stuff first. So let me get rid of this stuff first and then you can come back. So as a result of that, insulin resistance occurs, okay? The tissue has become resistant to communicating with insulin. Another way to think about it is that the, the tissue is rejecting insulin. So insulin is actually attempting, it's knocking on the door saying, hey, I got this glucose, and the tissue responds by saying, I'm not going to take up that glucose. Not gonna work. So the, the insulin gets rejected, the tissue becomes insulin resistant, and as a result of that, glucose has no exit strategy. It's sitting in your blood, it begins to pool over the course of time, and two hours later after eating that bowl of quinoa, you then check your blood glucose meter, you look at the number, and you're like, what, what? My glucose is a 284? That's weird. I didn't even have that much. I just had you know, a half a cup of quinoa and boom, now my glucose is up. I had one banana, for heaven's sakes, and my glucose is way up. I guess carbohydrate-rich food is bad for me. I guess I can't eat carbohydrates. And thus begins the, the anti-carbohydrate philosophy and thus begins this idea that carbohydrates are the problem and the cause. So if you had the opportunity to sort of reverse engineer this whole system to try and get that, those glucose molecules into the tissues, the answer is don't try and fight the symptomology. Just go backwards in time and try to find out what caused the plug. The plug was caused by not saturated fat, but excess saturated fat. It's the excess accumulation of saturated fat inside of muscle and liver that then overwhelms cells in those tissues to being able to respond and communicate with insulin. And as a result of that, the glucose got trapped. So all you have to do is go backwards in time and say, all right, let me reduce the total fat content of my diet, reduce the saturated fat content of my diet. And by doing so, I can preserve the insulin sensitivity of my liver and muscle cells. And as a result of that, the next time I eat carbohydrate rich anything, those glucose molecules can enter, your blood glucose stays nice and low, very well controlled, and now you're in an insulin sensitive state which makes your life much easier.